Hi everyone, uh, <coughs> happy to be here. Uh, Great, happy to uh, thank you, uh, Fondation Rafael Del Pino, for your invitation, and thank you all for being here. So uh, the purpose of this table uh, will be to share uh, the participant views, the attendees' views, uh, on the institutional uh, sides uh, and support of deep tech, uh, and question uh, this uh, this issue. So first, um, maybe my first question would be for you, uh, for the economist on my left. Um, how would you uh, define deep tech? Not going uh, uh, in too many details, but what would you, because when you have a good definition, then you can um, draft uh, policies that are tailored. Well, uh, thank you, Faisal, for the question. My name is uh, Fernando Galindo Rueda. I work at the OECD, and uh, thank you for uh, the invitation to, to the foundation. And, and uh, I'm glad to be here, joined by uh, fellow panelists. Uh, my work at the, at the OECD involves a number of things which I think uh, connect with, with the invitation, but I want to highlight as, as well that I'm speaking on personal capacity, so what I say here now, it, it, it does in no way necessarily mm -hmm. represent the views of the of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and, and Development. So w one of the things that uh, I'm personally directly involved with is uh, uh, work around the definitions uh, in the OECD and some of our guidelines around R&D, innovation, and related concepts. So uh, for a number of years, uh, I've been quite uh, heavily involved in this, in this task of uh, uh, bringing together people from different countries, agreeing on, on definitions. First, the concepts that are to be measured, the definitions. Uh, um, but we do that with a, a number of specific purposes. Uh, and uh, I think this is something I wanted to bring to, to this discussion. Why are we defining? I think uh, Professor Fiona Mari alluded to uh, to one of these key issues, uh, which is to differentiate. And, and, it, and in some sense, uh, uh, definitions are often to discriminate, but I mean that in, a, in the positive sense of, of the word, to treat different groups differently or different activities differently. There's lots of implications, especially around public support. It's an important element, which I'm sure we'll, we'll touch upon. Uh, but there are other issues that are, uh, we define in order to be able to, 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 to measure things. If we don't know what we're trying to measure, <laughs> then how are we going to do it? And, uh, and then to analyze and see how it behaves and what, what it explains and what it doesn't. Uh, but definitions also play a much broader role, which uh, have to do with um, uh, providing narratives <laughs> around them. And, uh, and th this idea of branding is quite important, and deep tech has a has a quite uh, quite a high brand value in, in itself sure. because we are we are trying to avoid uh, shallowness. Yeah, people tend <laughs> to say it's much more of a, we a consultant go, world we, than an economist. We want to go deeper, so but. Uh, at the same time, when we, we hear about this, we think that we know what we're talking about, yeah. but do we really know? And uh, here I have to be grateful to my fellow panelist, Asir, because he's the first person I heard the, the concept <laughs> deep tech from as, a, as we were carrying out a project uh, on Spain, uh, trying to, uh, to work with the Spanish government and supporting also the European Commission who funded this, uh, this work to support uh, uh, knowledge transfer and collaboration in, within Spain. And I see that this is... a uh, a study that is uh, extensively quoted in the, in the report, but let me try to go back to, to your question and give a, a couple of uh, brief observations about this idea of defining deep tech. And looking at, at the material, the, the definition of deep tech is, uh, again, plays a lot with this idea of uh, uh, what, it, what it is not or what we think it is not about and in contrast to, to what. So we, uh, there's the emphasis on aspects around going, uh, being at the frontier, so we are a bit tired about uh, just playing around with uh, innovations that are at margin and they are not bringing that substantially new things into uh, uh, Professor Fiona Mori alluded to the distinction with digital and many innovations that we see in the digital space are trying to bring little uh, economic value on top of uh, well-established technology. So there is th that element there, which uh, I think is uh, interesting uh, and relevant. There is a, a, a few others. That she alluded as well to the distinction between atoms and, and bytes. Exactly. And th th again, that also reflects uh, uh, this uh, kind of hostility, uh, which I think is important to take into account as well, uh, this hostility uh, against uh, the lack of authenticity or things that are a bit ethereal that people cannot understand that are not bedded in into the, uh, into, the, into the economy and society that may move to one place or another, that may be taxed anywhere. Uh, th there's all these aspects, and there is a big social push uh, against these things. So the, 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 that aspect of the definition tries to, to capture that. 
the aspect of linkages, which we cover a lot in this uh, study on knowledge transfer in Spain, which is important. And of course, it br it, uh, uh, this is at the point in which I'm getting a bit concerned about that it's trying to bring perhaps too much into the definition. So this, uh, the no. idea of bringing missions as well <laughs> now is a very popular concept. Uh, and uh, I think there's always a mission to some extent. Uh, sure. uh, but I think uh, perhaps uh, when this, we try to put too much into a definition, it ends up being a reflection of what we would like to have more of. But what do we want this definition for? Uh, uh, perhaps it's sometimes better to step a little bit back and then see what, uh, let's say, definitions that don't try to be so precise, uh, what they represent, what, whether, that, uh, mm. whether that explains something that we're interested in, and what are the trade-offs. Uh, or helping us understand why is there so much or so little of this deep tech. But I think my, my, my final call in this intervention would be to, um, I probably didn't answer your, your question, but it's, it's, it's an interesting concept. I think it's trying to get into something that is very relevant and that our society is keen to, to get to. Uh, but I think we need to have a, a deeper conversation about the meaning of, of deep tech. Yeah, sure. so, so first, technology that stands at the very frontier of the innovation, which are podemos decir el límite del conocimiento actual, mm -hmm. and also tangible components, which yeah. is key, because we, uh, com we are coming out of a period where uh, VC were seeking like SaaS business model, where everything was intangible, and when we go back to deep tech, we go back to the atoms. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we leave the world of, uh, of intangible to the tangible, and that's, I think, I believe it's a, it's a good way to, uh, to, deep in, to, to nail into uh, the concept. But um, maybe... Uh, you as, a, as an investor, um, uh, what did you, I mean, what is a deep tech company to you? When you have like um, companies that knock at your, at your door uh, in Technalia, how do you discriminate between uh, a, an underlying technology that is truly deep and a um, company that you believe is not very, very deep? What is your cr mm. criteria as, as an investor? I mean, you have uh, the reflex of an investor. Mm. Well, thank you very much, uh, Fundación Rafael del Pino, uh, for this uh, kind invitation. And uh, it's a real pleasure being here in this panel with so many people that I, that I, that I know. Uh, Maciel Rufino, I'm actually, well, I'm, yeah, we could say I'm an investor. I'm a venture builder. So that's another concept yeah, that's, that goes that, that's why very, was. very close to uh, deep tech and perhaps uh, uh, for the forthcoming research paper. <laughs> fostered by Fundación Rafael del Pino, we could delve into the um, uh, venture building uh, concept. So basically, um, my role, I'm, I'm the CEO and uh, founder of uh, Technaria Ventures, and my role is basically to help tech, uh, take technologies from up to market. Okay, So I work alongside uh, Technalia, which is uh, the largest uh, uh, private research uh, organization in Southern Europe with 1,300 researchers, and we are trying to extract some value by identifying technologies, and I'm going just to cover the four different uh, realms of uh, activity within uh, uh, technology venture that I think addresses the question. So the first thing is we try to identify the nuggets inside uh, uh, Technalia that are basically uh, technologies that are developed oftentimes or almost always by uh, public money. Uh, coming from uh, competitive funding that could emanate from Europe, or it could be coming from non-competitive uh, funding from uh, uh, Basque government, Madrid government, or, or others. And we try to identify technologies that have the potential to resolve P&L problems, problems for which someone in the industry is going to be willing to pay. And this is very important, because deep tech goes almost hand in hand with B2B business models. And therefore, from the onset, we need to be very close to what are the problems that have a, a dimension, an economic dimension that are worthwhile resolving. And this is the first item. Then afterwards, you need to protect them in the best possible way. There is IP. You need to mitigate their uh, escalation risk. So something that works in the lab may not work on their um, uh, production uh, context, uh, working 24 hours, seven days uh, a week. And, uh, and then regulatory comes a, a very uh, has a very important role because uh, oftentimes in, the, in deep tech you are at the forefront creating uh, new needs, creating new product categories mm -hmm. that uh, still need to be regulated. And uh, public sector plays a, 
our important role. Then the second item that uh, oftentimes is played down, particularly in Spain, are teams. We had that discussion just before coming uh, into, into here. Uh, we need to improve the quality of the deal flow. And in deep tech, you need well-rounded teams. You need, uh, uh, ideally, to have researchers, researchers that could play, as I often say, the Bosniak type of role in Apple. But you need the Steve Jobs. And the bad news are that the Steve Jobs are usually not in the research organizations, nor in the labs of universities. And connecting those two types of uh, stakeholders that oftentimes don't interact in a natural basis is of paramount importance. And it's probably the most complicated uh, task that I have as a, as a venture builder. So but there, the would good the, news, there would be the lack of talent at that point. Well, I mean, we have disconnected talent. Um, we, I mean, we have entrepreneurial pockets, so people with entrepreneurial uh, capabilities, and then we have excellent science in Spain. But it's very hard to connect the two of them. And oftentimes, when we create deep tech companies, we create with teams that were in the lab. And mm -hmm. this is fair enough, but you need complementary profiles. And oftentimes, we don't realize about it. But once you get the two type of uh, stakeholders in place, money is out there. I mean, uh, I just was explaining that in an A series that we were targeting 5 million euros, we ended up raising 12.5 million euros and turning down 10 million euros. But the money is not going from Spain, which is also a very important factor. In this funding round, so uh, all the capital was coming from the US, was coming from Norway, was coming from France, but just almost no money was coming from Spain. So. There is a lot of work to be done at the corporate venture uh, capital uh, VC realm in, uh, in Spain and the specific uh, uh, specialist funds in, uh, in, uh, in deep tech. So, yeah, uh, those are some of the, uh, of the key elements in so that, uh, my work. Sure, that's one of the gaps that we saw. Uh, I mean, the money is coming from abroad. Uh, and, w I mean, why? Because in the end, we managed to build over the last, I would say, 10 years in Europe, a deeper and a strong VC industry, and yet only 15, 25% of domestic uh, share of uh, that VC industry is allocated to deep tech. So maybe a question for Lars, how do you explain this gap in deep tech uh, funding, especially private funding? I think I actually got a, uh, a good answer to that one. It's because they don't care about it. <laughs> It's because there's no money in it. It's way too hard to put to the market. You can't get into a Ferrari fast <laughs> if you are investing into deep tech. The current model of venture capital, and if you're very precise, it's actually more driven by the limited partners and the expectancy of returns than actually the fund managers. So if you actually want to change something, stop bitching about the venture capital, I would rather go to the limited partners and say, you need to do things differently. You need to set up your limited partnership agreement. It's getting very detailed now, sorry, but you need to do this in a different way. What needs to happen in Europe and what needs to happen in Spain is that we need to diversify completely the way that we look at limited partners. We need to deregulate so that we can get more pension funds interested in this, we need foundations to be interested in this, and we need family offices to be interested in this. Those are the ones that actually have the patient capital. We should not expect anyone else to actually come up with the patient capital. If I was a high net worth individual, would I invest into deep tech? Maybe if I was, I was very, very, very rich. If not, I would probably be investing into something else. But there are institutions that actually have exactly that type of capital. So what we need to do, we need to leverage our own wealth, both in Spain and in Europe. So where is that, and by our own values and our welfare society, and in a way where that welfare society has become money, which is, for example, in our pension funds. If you look in just to the UK, it's a scandal that most of the pension funds that invest into UK healthcare and medical development is American pension funds. That just can't be true any longer. So we need other institutional investors to step up to take a completely different type of responsibility for Europe and also for Spain. Because if not, we won't have a prosperity. 
We won't have a welfare society. It will simply, you know, go elsewhere. So one of the easiest ways to say why we need deep tech is that, do you want to live a great life? If yes, then start investing into deep tech. If you do not, if you want a bad life, <laughs> no. But I think there is a tendency to optimize for wealth and not for a great life. And the way that we've seen that the world has optimized in, to, in venture capital for <coughs> wealth and not a great life is that we've put an enormous amount of sums into software as a service and purely digital companies. Digital companies, by the way, are great. I don't want to say anything bad about it because we all have an iPhone here or something else and you know, we all love apps and what they can do for us. And they're all based on a fundamental software as a service methodology and that's the way they earn money. The problem for a country, and the perspective should be the country here, is that if you invest predominantly into those companies, you create wealth for very few people, and the production apparatus is outside of your own country. One of the other reasons to invest in deep tech is that it re-educates your blue-collar workers. I bet that those countries in Europe that underinvest in deep tech We'll, go, we'll lose social coherence. We'll have more poor people and very few rich people. The way that you actually, behind any physicist that creates a new type of solution, is a new way to produce. It's a new factory. So behind every physicist stands blue-collar workers that know how to do this. So we need to start appreciating the work of the hand. And we haven't done that, by the way. What we have done in Europe and what we've done in the US is where we thought that we could outsource everything that had to do with production. And now the ones that we gave the production are now dominating us. Last week came out the report from an Australian think tank. You've probably seen it. China is now leading in two-thirds of all the important technologies of the world. Do we want this to happen or not? If not, then we need to start investing into deep tech and into our universities. And it's not just about getting rich, it's actually because you want to continue living a great life. That's it. So, so you mentioned the, uh, the, maybe the public incentives. Um, you probably saw uh, the, the National uh, uh, Inflation Reduction Act uh, promoted by uh, uh, Joe Biden that mm -hmm. has created a huge um, uh, incentive to uh, LP uh, actually to invest yeah. in deep technology, maybe um, too much in clean techs because it was really tailored uh, for deep tech, uh, for clean techs. But it shows that once you have uh, a state behind uh, that is uh, committed and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and strongly committed to uh, create the right incentives, you manage to allocate the money. But what are those uh, incentives? We mentioned maybe uh, public okay. subsidies, you have proc public pro procurement, you have I mean, which is the, the, yeah, the most yeah, yeah. relevant okay. for Okay, so, so let's, let's, let's use, for example, so what deep tech companies, ventures really want is an annoying customer. A very detailed, oriented customer, also in business to business, that can define how they want the solution and how it should look like. So the, one of the ways that you can drive this is that you can, for example, you can incentivize government, in this case, the Spanish government. <coughs> So, I'll get back to this, but just a very, very short example of how this was done with SpaceX. SpaceX was developed because they did innovation in procurement. They also have Elon Musk, but anyway. So, innovation in procurement. So, what they did is that for the cost project, so that was, a, you know, what NASA needed to buy from a very small company at the end, what was called Falcon X, which is now SpaceX. At the time, they wanted them to buy something very specific. They set up very specific milestones. And what they did, and that's the magic of what they did, is that they would only give Falcon, which at the time became SpaceX, SpaceX the money if they simultaneously developed a, civ a civilian market. So that's, a, that's a, a way to incentivize how you actually built companies that have a very specific capacity. Like who wouldn't have the capacity of the US and SpaceX 
for six billion dollars. That's very, very cheap. So I think what needs to happen in Spain, for example, is very concrete and very directed incentives to set up procurement schemes so that the government can stop buying the cheapest stuff, because that's the you know, fundamental thing, and start buying early stage products, yeah. prototype solutions from Spanish companies, because right now they're not. So the government needs to step in and actually act as the one that actually incentivizes the development of things. And it's, and, it's, and it's even more relevant that we are talking about um, uh, technologies where uh, sometimes the market does not exist yet. So yes, so that makes it very, very hard. So uh, what you need to do when the market doesn't exist is that you, from a country perspective, from my perspective also, is that you need to build on your own positions of strength. So you've looked into your core sectors. <coughs> those can be the ones that actually are the demand signal for those companies to create that market. Otherwise, it won't work. Yeah. That's the annoying customer. If you go to a very large Spanish company, they are probably on a very, very annoying market, you know, a very well-developed market. So the, some of those companies can work with them to actually develop their product and, uh, and get going in that way. Yeah, sure. Um, so maybe uh, if we, uh, I mean, if we try to uh, um, see some solutions, I mean, we started to nail into it a bit. Mm. Um, what should be done at the EU level? You mentioned the rise of China. Uh, the U.S. now um, uh, left behind uh, its particular uh, bottom-up uh, strategy to uh, mm. come back to vertical industrial uh, policies. Um, now it's... Um, I mean, what should be done at the EU level? Maybe, Oscar, okay. you, the EU guy. <laughs> okay, so first of all, thanks a lot for inviting me. It's been really a pleasure to be part of this study. Congratulations, Vicente and Jan and all the team. And it's really a pleasure to, to share this panel with a lot of friends and people that we have been working for the last years, okay, to promote our innovation ecosystem at next level, okay? The, for those who don't know me, I've been running, I've been the CEO of a technology transfer program, it's called Collider, and taking advantage of Malvo Congress ecosystem, an umbrella, international umbrella that happened in Barcelona, Shanghai, and Los Angeles, and was quite useful to promote our innovation ecosystem at the next level. Okay? What we have learned in the last five years, as, as, an, in, as an initial para, uh, public initiative, okay, that deep tech is not a debate about tech, okay? it's a debate about economy is the excuse of transforming our knowledge into real market value. That is what Lars was saying, okay? Uh, innovation is a question of fitting two different uh, speeds. Technology, readiness, and readiness of the market to adopt it. Willingness, someone to pay, it as, as it is someone that has shared with us. And if, you, if we want to transform our economy, we should start understanding what's our economy made about, what's compound, those traditional sectors. What's our strengths? Okay, and I think it's time to understand in which sectors, on which, uh, or which technologies could Europe or could Spain we could be competitive on. Mm. I think there's a lot of uh, uh, good, uh, good noise, good noises about uh, investment, uh, big numbers, startups, but I, I think it's time to focus on those sectors. If we have learned from our capital, it's so that I'm, as a, since last year, I'm all in the investment side in deep tech, there's European scale, a lot of opportunities, and I'm assessing a lot of international corporates to launch new business or different international uh, research institutions to transform the way they are waiting, uh, working today, instead of being measured of the hate of our publications, why not to be measured on the number of private contracts by industry? I think this is a quite KPI to be measured. We need to change the model. I think it's, Europe has been very good in producing research, knowledge, but I think it's time to transform that knowledge into a real market industry, new jobs, new corporates. And it's true that investments as a risk, risk business model, okay? Mm. Builder does not behave as investor. We, should, we will see in the future um, a point of contact to these two walls. And government should work to create the first initiatives. What we have learned in the last five years in Collider is we start being behaving as a venture leader, as, as I said, but we understood that we didn't have the industry ready to adopt technology. And innovation should be meshed in, in impacting the PNL, 
new revenues or new or cost reduction. If it's not measured in impact, this is a different word. This imagination is not innovation. That's what we learned, we should work in three different angles. First of all, is visibilize the research possibility industry. The sooner the industry was in this conversation with research, the sooner one research will say, this does not make sense for the market. Why not working in that direction? Making proof of concepts and so on. That it's true that in this point of view, governments should create the conditions to behave, for example, as, like as, as Finland. Finland is the only country in Europe that they invest, do you know, the 10% 10% versus air, uh, investment in the country year, 40% all the investments are done in the country, 40% are going to deep tech. In Spain, only 15%. So we have a lot of room to improve. If we compared five years ago, it's true that it's growing and growing. So first of all, be civilizing, setting point of contact with industry and research. Second point of view, those research that are ready to be transferred to the market and those sectors that are ready to adopt technology, built together, co-creation, coexistence. And we need to understand, and as here was mentioning, it's not the same the person who is interested in making research, but the person who has the skills, right, schools to commercialize. And this, that's those five actors of the ecosystem that Fiona was mentioning. It's true. Uh, one startup don't give them money, they waste them. <laughs> they give smart money, customers. Okay, and give them the feasibility to work agile and fail fast, as the Americans say very well. No? So, visualizing, building, and third, scaling. Well, I do believe that this that we have improved a lot in European investment and more in Spain. The last first year than 2019, we, we had nearly one billion a year of investment startups. 2020, we had 4.5. For 4.5, sorry, was in 2021. 2022, we have 4.3. Only 15% of these investments are R&D. And nearly 50% of startups came from deep tech. I'm not talking about spin-offs. I'm talking AI, I'm talking deep, uh, med tech. So we have a good opportunity there. So, But we need to still work on the early stage phases, creating the conditions to change the mindset, the promoting entrepreneurial mindset in the researchers change the model instead of being measured on how the number of public grants they have raised, what's the impact, real impact they are really getting to the market. And the way of measuring it is what's the number of contracts that the industry are contracting every day, finding this a sustainable way. And on the other side, we don't have in Europe, I I'm apologize, I don't want to make friends, we don't have in Europe uh, the same market, you know, investment market at the States or, as, or as Singapore. But we have good knowledge there. We should work in this, those sectors we have knowledge that we could be competitive on. If we, you should ask me, I would say, regarding our economy, it's med tech as evolution of biotech. We have really a good hospitals, innovation campus, where we have all the stakeholders of the sector. So I do believe that digital health, Spain could play up really creating global solutions in, in a globe scale. And Agrotech as our sector that is very important in our economy, and third, it could be all related to energy transition. Okay, but this we should believe in those the early stage, and of course, creating more sense, more conversation in which sectors are more prevalent today, more important for us today, and which sectors we should be competitive in the future. No? Okay, quite clear. And maybe uh, as you finished your stance with Spain, maybe. Uh, it's the, the best way to uh, commit people uh, in, uh, in the room. Uh, maybe uh, some questions uh, from the public uh, at this stage. Um, the first is always the, the most difficult. It's a question for me. Well, it's a 
<laughs> well, we, we can complement it, perhaps because I mentioned that they were uh, publicly funded projects. Um, well, that's the way it starts in, uh, in, in Spain, Europe, and in the US. I mean, behind iPhone uh, development, there is plenty of public money. Behind, you know, many things, uh, there, there is plenty of public money, okay? So you need, initially, some public money to break barriers of knowledge, to create technological concepts that then uh, you are going to apply eventually to resolve industrial problems. But that's the definition of a term in innovation called valley of death. You have public um, uh, acting uh, to address uh, a need to, uh, to develop societal solutions uh, where private wouldn't get involved because of the high risk uh, of this endeavor. And at some point in time is where you need to make a smart use of uh, those resources smart use of uh, the outcomes funded by this public money so that you could entice private uh, capital, the risking both on market and ideally on technology so that they could uh, uh, catch over. And basically, I just want to emphasize again the important role that uh, venture builders and redefining tech transfer offices in Spain, alongside, uh, uh, in line with the report by the OCD where we uh, got to meet uh, with, uh, with Fernando, uh, is of paramount importance that the people who are trying to extract a value out of uh, those uh, public investments uh, change their mindset or transform into venture builders that are able to identify those technologies, create teams, and just entice private capital just by showing them that the risk uh, of uh, getting their money deployed is uh, lower. So first risk with the last, go ahead. No, I just want to say that, and just building on also on our, on our report, right? I, I think obviously you just implement all the recommendations and then we'll be good. Mm -hmm. But anyway, <laughs> uh, is that, you know, also from this ecosystem perspective and the five stakeholders is that nobody really owns innovation. Every, you know, the, it's, 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 a, it's a task where, where everyone needs to, needs to, to chip in. Uh, I think there's just a very specific case for, for, for Europe where we so far has not been able to, um, to unleash, I would say, some of the capital um, that we have and that you may also have in, in, in Spain to, uh, to fund some of these uh, fantastic companies. One of the key problems we, we talk about here, the early stages, I, if I look at Europe in more in general and not specifically Spain, I would probably say that I actually think there is enough seed capital in Europe right now. I think our main problem is the scale up, I would call growth equity investments, where you know even the best companies are now becoming Delaware companies or even you know uh, are, are are moving even to even to China, and you know. That's simply a problem because that means that we have become the accelerator for the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And we are not sort of all of the solutions that we, in a way, paid for, you know, our taxpayers paid for, are we actually not getting, but they're getting into the hands of, of, of other people. So I think there our policy should be, in a way, less naive mm -hmm. uh, around those type of investments. And I do believe that the investments uh, needs to be so significant that it cannot be solved by the taxpayers' money, uh, but we simply need to drive in a different type of private capital to that, that, that can actually help us with this uh, in very important mission. I sometimes say when I'm in Brussels, and I was actually in Brussels this morning to talk about European competitiveness, and the question was, you know, what should Europe do? And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's hard not to be become very pessimistic, by the way, right? because we seem to be losing you know, um, and I think there needs to be not only uh, a fundamental different type of what we need to drive in money, but we also need to do some of the harder parts. And don't get me wrong, driving in new capital can be hard, but there's some fundamental organizational changes that also need to happen in Brussels, maybe even your, in your own organizations, and those are going to hurt, like 
uh, the way that we evaluate research, the way that we evaluate innovation, the way that we simply do things, right? Why do you need to write, I don't know, a 100-page application to get a, a million euros? It's nuts, right? We simply need to do things differently, right? We can't, you know, my biggest fear is that we get everything right in terms of the money, but we still have a system that really doesn't appreciate the heretical ideas, those ideas that is at the fringe of a paradigm. I bet that if Moderna and CureVac had showed up in Denmark, let's use my own country as an example, Denmark would not have funded them in 2013. They showed up and NIH and NSF, even in the US, did not want to fund them. But DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, said, we'll fund you because they seem to be a little bit crazy. And if everyone is saying that you have a bad idea, then you probably have a good idea, right? That's also the way it is in life, right? If everyone tells you that you have a great idea, you have a bad idea because your level of, of, of you know, you need a higher level of ambition, right? So I think that's a fundamental problem that we need to solve in our society, our ability to appreciate those ideas that are at the outskirts of a paradigm, because otherwise we're funding things that you know, will not, at the end of the day, make a problem. But that's a different conversation. But we need to stop using peer review and other conservative, you know, stop using peer review in the way that you evaluate innovation. How come we found it? This is all over Europe. We are using peer review, which was invented after the Second World War in the UK, to discipline and driving conservatism within a scientific field has now become the predominant way of evaluating innovation and innovative ideas in Europe. It's, it's crazy how we ended up there. So with all the money of the world, if we don't make all these changes that make the government people uncomfortable, then we won't get there. We need to make some people uncomfortable. Otherwise, we won't get there. If you permit me, last to answer. I, I do believe that it's depending on the maturity of the ecosystem. In, a, in an early stage a maturity a, a state, government should create the initial conditions. It's the case of Israel, it's the case of states. But the challenge there is to understand what's the, the, the term that you are expecting from the government perspective to get results of the output. I do believe we need to change the paradigm in Europe. We've been very good in creating knowledge, but it's time to, to, to find a, a payback for this knowledge into market value. We need to change the paradigm in the research institutions. And we need to rethink what's the, what Europe should be competitive at. Israel have it very clear. We, they produce technology for the rest of the world. Okay? What's the, we, what will be the model for Europe? I believe that this is the right question. And afterwards, depending on, of course, depending on the, the, the maturity of the tactic for the industry, there are some, some technologies that require more time. For example, frontier materials. Frontier materials will be the, more, the next revolution in humanity after AI. With a market of nearly three trillions, materials everywhere will change the way we're producing the manufacturing, the, the health, but I think the, the society is not re is prepared yet. But one example, we convinced John Hoffman, and this was last year when I was in Mugabe Capital, to, to move one international commercial for material materials and an event is called Baselex to Barcelona. But you, and you can imagine Spain do not invest eight, the eight billions that Manchester invests a year. But we convinced the international community we have a community to create these global conversations. So we need to understand, yes, public money, but in the early stage. Public money with a specific output, not public money to fund uh, large research institutions that anyone does not know what they are working on. I don't think it's time to change this model. And maybe public money through the right channel like of course. Pro public procurement would be... Apologize, we send the provoking a little bit. I'm <laughs> sure I'm not going to invite it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, yes. Okay, she was, uh, okay. Uh, 
Catalina Martinez from the Spanish National Research Council. Very provocative what you just said. <laughs> I don't agree at all. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, uh, what about Catalina, Catalina Caricó? Uh, she was doing fundamental research for a long mm -hmm. time and she struggled to, to get funding. But uh, that is not my question. My question is uh, for the venture builders, uh, maybe uh, Asier and you, but for the others too, uh, what is the role of intellectual property to discriminate uh, here between deep tech and digital tech? What is the role of uh, intellectual property here? Asier, for example. Well, uh, the, the role for intellectual property to discriminate uh, alongside the definition of, uh, of deep tech. I mean, well, uh, uh, I mean, IP will go hand in hand with, uh, with deep tech. Uh, but deep tech is also uh, bytes. I'm coming from the hardware side. I mean, we uh, create a spin of companies as I often say, where uh, tracks come and go, because there is uh, tangible stuff, right? Uh, but, um, well, j just very quickly on the definition of deep tech. To me, it's a twofold risk, basically technological and market risk, okay? And uh, there, you can have hardware, but you can have software, okay? And, um, and well, in Spain, what happens is that, uh, and that's why the first time I spoke with Fernando, I spoke about deep tech. There is plenty of confusion still about uh, a, a technological entrepreneurship, okay? And uh, it's uh, a very important that uh, people uh, clearly see the differences between deep tech, biotech, digital, okay? Digital sort of copycats, because there are many people called venture builders in Spain, like Nucleo, Carlos Blanco, so on and so forth, and they are venture builders, but basically they spot things that work in the US, in B2C, in digital, or in Asia, and they copy it quite uh, fast in Spain, and they replicate the cabifies of the world versus the Uber, and this is, you know, a business model that works very well, you know, so, and, and definitely, uh, as policymakers, you have to foster this type of uh, uh, ecosystems, but what works for that digital realm doesn't work for deep tech. And the problem with deep tech is that you need the IP, but not only the, 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 the IP. IP is not enough. That's, that's a critical item. That oftentimes when uh, uh, you uh, endeavor to do venture building or, or tech transfer, uh, researchers believe that with IP everything is, uh, is sorted out. But it's just the beginning, and sometimes it's not even the beginning. Teams are critical, and again, it makes sense that there is no VC in Europe because there is not that much quality and critical mass of good deal flow. That's the reality. I was talking to Klima the other day, Klima, okay, so 250 million euros, 200, 250 million euro uh, VC, you know, in Spain for decarbonization. They were doubting whether they uh, were going to invest on A-series, B-series, hardware, uh, bytes. I mean, they are investing in B-series and, and bytes because there is not enough, uh, uh, you know, deal flow in Spain uh, for deep tech, hard, A-series or seed, you know, so and that's a reality. So, and why? Because you need teams, those well-rounded teams, you need venture builders, you know, working on IP, but combining IP with well-rounded teams. So. I don't know if that's the question. Scouting the right opportunities within the universities to circle the, uh, the uh, framework. Uh, uh, and, right. and just to finish off, sometimes you could even license out. The best thing to do, perhaps, is just to license out the IP and get just fresh way around the team. You know, people that were not even in the lab. So sure. If you permit me add something to that, uh, first like of one all, word, uh, the if school if they are good researchers, we need to help them. We civilize to give trust to investors. But it's a pity to realize that the long tail in research do, has not transferred properly to the market, okay? And we, I, I do believe we have improved a lot, but we compare investment, uh, plan, uh, comparing to R&D a year, I do believe we in Spain, we have a lot of room to improve. And there are two sectors that are very pro, 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 uh, they are, who are investing more. I do believe next generation funds should help them instead of rescuing an industry. <laughs> we should use that funds to transform industry in those sectors, which as economist Vernon said, uh, one country, depending on the knowledge, depending on their cost, attract a specific economy.
I think it's time to think in which economy industry Spain or other countries in Europe could be competitive at. Regarding your question, and could learn something in, in this year, what we have learned, I do believe that we, it's sometimes the IP, or more than the IP, how to protect an invention, I do believe. It's as we have promoted in researchers to publish, to publish, to publish, it's something that sometimes it's a risky. And um, from investment and investors' perspective, as a risk management business, okay, uh, sometimes the first starting point is that this is, it, it makes sense. It's not the same an idea, the business opportunity, the sustainable business model. You read on me of these three steps, okay? So a good idea, a good business opportunity in a sector at an innovation that is everything is published doesn't make sense to invest money because the early stage so it's something that sometimes you need to make a very big effort or we have Clara Pombo from there that they have a good expertise on that okay and afterwards we're going to the technology transfer it's not only about the team of course I agree on that the most uh, the most challenge the most challenging a technology transfer uh, program uh, except one case, the industry that contract and a specific R&D regarding their innovation, incremental innovation, for example, this is a coexistence between an industry and research, that this is direct innovation to the market. But the most of technology transfer, this is not only about complementing this merging talent from researchers and commercializing, this a comp program, its main objective and the main challenge is to understand what's the best sectors to start from and what's the best product market fit. And this is, this is perhaps the most challenging the technology transfer. And that's not require a lot of money. It requires a specific 15 weeks where industry, where mentors and several experts, of course, and a merged balanced talent team with research entrepreneurs that are working together. I don't know if it makes sense for you. Okay. So yeah, maybe we will leave the um, we we'll leave the floor to the second <laughs> table and, and, and pursue this uh, uh, very interesting discussion later. We are going to, uh, to leave the floor to those who actually take the risk, which okay. are much more brave than we do, which are the entrepreneurs, and I think that they deserve to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to talk and to exchange with the room. Uh, thank you. Thank you.